you know, it's really interesting having been around um, Gavi since its beginning um, to both look at the way it has changed over time and also to kind of understand um, the effects the world has had on it and we have had on the world. So this is going to be a brief history. It's not comprehensive by any means, but it's going to talk about some points that I think are important um, to understanding how we got to where we are today and what place we've had. So if I want to start at the, at the beginning here, um, what's interesting about um, immunization is that if you go back to um, the beginning, so 1974, um, there was about 5% of coverage in the developing world for vaccine. So, so this really is a very low amount. It was only six vaccines, and we'll come back to that. Um, but it, it really didn't have a lot of energy, even though the immunization programs were set up then. And what really made it take off was um, one man, Jim Grant, who was the executive director of UNICEF, and he was a man on a mission. He used to stop and talk to um, people, politicians. He would pull a pack of oral rehydration salts out of his pocket. And, and his, his message was GOBI, so growth monitoring, oral rehydration salts, um, breastfeeding and immunization as the priority. And so he was constantly pushing this, and he, he said, we need universal childhood immunization by um, 1990. It, it was uh, reported that the world reached universal childhood immunization, which was defined as 80 percent. Um, the actual number was uh, lower than that. You can see here it's in the, it's in the high 60s, but um, um, it, was a, it was an inspiring moment. But of course, what happened was Jim Grant got sick, and um, he was out of the picture, and his um, successor, who I knew and worked with well, said, I need to do something different. Um, you know, that was him, and I'm, you know, a new leader, and I have to do something. So immunization, although remained a priority of UNICEF, it was one of many and not just at the top, and we saw those numbers um, drop down. At the time, we decided to create a new initiative called the Children's Vaccine Initiative. And again, um, I was involved with that. I was a signatory in it. Um, um, but what was interesting about that is that its goal was to try to make a vaccines or vaccines that were orally used, temperature sensitive, one dose. Um, and industry got involved. It was a big movement to create a whole new renaissance and uh, there ultimately was a battle because industry went off. They asked the public sector for the one thing that it wanted. And the public sector said the most important thing is a heat-stable polio vaccine. They went off, spent two years, developed a heat-stable polio vaccine, came back, and um, uh, the authorities-to-be said, oh, we would never consider that because we wouldn't want to upset people, and they were used to the system we have and everything else, and it led to a complete fragmentation with industry and um, um, the public sector with a complete lack of trust. So that's kind of where we were, and that background's important because in 2000, when the decision was made to launch Gavi, and, and there was a lot of discussions about this, the need to have something to drive forward because now there were new and powerful new vaccines that weren't getting out, um, the, the real issue was this was a... Um, you know, an experiment because there had been coming off this really fracturing of relationships between um, the public sector and private sector. And of course, what we've seen over time has been the climb in number of, 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 um, of, of coverage of vaccine um, going from here um, in the high 60s up into the low 80s. And of course, you see this drop off, which we'll get to later, which relates to what COVID did. But importantly, we also have an increase from 6 to 19 antigens. And that's really what Gavi was about. Now, the reason that controversy is is important because um, they weren't receiving these new and powerful vaccines, but also manufacturers at that moment in time were focused on um, very high-priced markets and, and providing low volume, and, and they didn't understand necessarily that it would make sense to go the other way, which is to try to create a very high-volume and low-cost or lower-cost market. And that was what we had to sell as a community.
So when we built the new um, alliance, we included vaccine manufacturers, both developed and developing countries, as members um, of the alliance. And you can see in here, um, you know, here's uh, Dr. Brundtland um, as the head of WHO, Bill Gates, um, um, but also um, the, the head of UNICEF, um, um, uh, Jim Grant's um, um, uh, successor. But also we had um, uh, people from uh, both developing countries, but also from industry as part of the launch. And therefore, this has been, and at the time, was somewhat controversial. There were many people in civil society that said industry has a conflict, they shouldn't be involved. But th at the end of the day, we, we don't try to not have conflicts. We allow conflicts, but we manage those conflicts. And we believe philosophically that industry is part of the solution and has to be part of the conversation. And that, I think, is one of the real powers of our successes going forward. So Gavi has an, is an alliance, as I said, and, and on the top you have the four kind of core members, which is WHO, UNICEF, um, the Gates Foundation, and the World Bank. But you can see below the many, many different groups that are part of the alliance. And um, you know this is really important. It makes decision making hard. So at a board meeting, we sometimes have as many as 175 people at the board meeting. Um, but when a consensus is made around that board table, basically everybody that has influence in immunization is part of that consensus. And that's how it kind of moves the whole field forward. And in a sense, that's the power of the alliance. It's, it's interesting because a lot of people don't know the history of this. But when Gavi first started, there were actually two different organizations. There was the Secretariat, which was a small group of people whose job was to work with the partners on the programs. And then there was the, um, the Vaccine Fund. And that Vaccine Fund was set up as a place to raise money for this and have resources. And Nelson Mandela was the first chair. Um, I had an opportunity to work with Nelson Mandela um, you know, when he did this. And, and there's many great quotes of, of Nelson about uh, where a child um, is born shouldn't determine whether they live or die. Um, uh, later on, Grasa Michelle played that role. Um, and um, we've had many distinguished um, leaders. We've had uh, partner leaders, um, uh, but also we've had um, 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 uh, later on when the two joined, we had a set of independents. Mary Robinson was the chair when they joined the former prime minister of Ireland, first female prime minister of Ireland, Dagfin Huybraten, who hired me in Gozi, and now I'm Jose Manuel Barroso. So very successful, distinguished group of alumni uh, providing leadership for the board. Now, you know, there is no question that Gavi has been incredibly successful. Um, what we have here is, um, you know, the talk about going to scale. So um, one billion unique children um, um, uh, immunized were reached sometime in the last year. We don't have the official numbers from Wunik now, but given the amount of people that are vaccinated per year, we know that we have passed that threshold. Um, the reason we talk about unique children is because these children receive many vaccines, most of them. And so it's not about counting every single vaccine or every single exposure. It's, you know, the individuals who are reached. And, and, and that's really important. We reach about 65, 000, 65 million unique children um, per year. Um, but also, um, when you talk about scale, it isn't, doesn't stop there. Um, we also provide vaccines for campaigns. So um, more than another 1.4 billion um, people reached with campaign vaccines. And of course, um, uh, COVAX uh, reached another close to 2 billion people. So this has been in terms of scale and effects across the world. But you, know, you can also say, in a sense, who cares? A lot of vaccines. The really critical thing to talk about is what is the effect. And, and this is, if there's any one slide to think about, it's really this one. Um, on the left here is a 70% reduction in vaccine-preventable child deaths in, in Gavi countries. Um, and, and obviously, um, at the end, that's really important. And this um, is a contributing factor to the um, about 50% reduction in under five mortality rate that occurred um, during this period. So, um, this is perhaps the most important index of development. And, and so the fact that we um, were part of this, it's very hard to attribute all of this to vaccines. There are other things that happen, and that's why I'm saying contributing to mortality. Um, but these really are um, some of the greatest effects. In fact, recently somebody talked about what's the, 
what's the single um, you know, biggest accomplishment in, in, in this century, and people talk about you know, the computers and you know, electricity, this, that. Probably the single biggest thing is the expansion in life expectancy that has occurred, and of course a lot of it is due um, to this work. So Gavi not only works on, on trying to make sure that there are vaccines, but um, it is absolutely critical to also think about the financing side of it. And so um, again, when these new vaccines were appearing, they start out in, a, in the original model, a very high price, low volume, we're trying to shift that. And so over the years, the, the Gavi market shaping has worked very successfully. There are 11 vaccines that WHO recommends for every child to get. Those are listed on the left. Um, when I say child, one of those is, is HPV, which of course is in adolescence, but in some sense they're considered children as well. And um, the cost of this, it isn't exactly an apples um, to apples comparison because in the US and in Europe, they use slightly different antigens and combinations. But if you kind of look at what the best collection of vaccines would be in the United States. It costs about $1,300 to immunize a child, and Gavi's costs are between $24 and $28. The reason there is a differential there is because it depends on whether we're talking one or two doses of HPV vaccine. But this is, if you are fast on your calculations, a 98% reduction in um, the cost of vaccines. And this is obviously very important for sustainability. So over time, Gavi's portfolio has grown, grown dramatically, and we now provide support against 19 infectious diseases through 50 different um, products. Um, and over time, as we've done that, we've also enhanced the ability to deal with epidemic diseases. This was an important change. Um, these vaccines are, are, many of them, very critical. I'm going to talk about a few of them in a minute, but... Um, you know, yellow fever, obviously one of the original vaccines, but a, but a, disease, a disease that can cause um, really devastating epidemics. Um, the fact that we, we, we have uh, meningitis vaccines, uh, meningitis A, there used to be a belt across Africa, the meningitis belt, where every three to four years you would see waves of disease paralyzing the countries because Three to three to four percent of the population would get meningitis, and you can imagine people were panicked. Um, that has been almost completely eliminated. There's now almost no cases of of um, meningitis A, um, diarrhea, and pneumonia, two largest killers of children, and these are the two causes of of vaccines for those. Um, and of course, now um, you know new vaccines like Ebola. Um, very important um, how we worked on that, and I'll come back to that, but also typhoid, which is an important cause of antimicrobial resistance, and um, now um, um, uh, malaria as a, a first parasitic vaccine, and of course, um, COVID. Now, I'm going to take a moment to, to talk about this slide because what I've tried to do is pull out during the different moments of Gavi, and this is going from Gavi 1.0 in the original 2000 timeline up to um, the future, and here it's called writing the future of immunization since we don't know what it is yet. But, um, you know, I'll talk about the hepatitis B in a second, but we started having health system support in 2006. This is critical. Vaccines don't deliver themselves. It's an important part of what we do. And so although we focus on, on, on immunization systems, we are strengthening primary health care systems. And um, that has been a very important role that Gavi has played. We also started having innovative finance during this period, IFM, which allowed us to raise enormous amounts of money and advanced market commitments. So we began to be known for financial innovations. I've already mentioned um, the meninge Afrovac, that's the meningitis A vaccine that I talked about. Um, during this period, between these two periods, and this is uh, when I joined Gavi, um, Gavi um, had gotten a lot of money through IFM, and so it was flush for a while. And um, at the time, the finances perhaps weren't being followed as closely as they could be, and we ended up in a situation where Gavi was really short of funds and almost had uh, not enough money to be a going concern. And so um, uh, we had our first donor replenishment conference. Um, it actually happened right before I started, but I was there. Um, part of it was donors wanted to know that um, there was going to be a CEO there that was going to manage their funds, and they could you know, uh, look me in the eye. And, and um, we had a very successful conference. We tried to raise $3.7 billion and um, uh, raised 4.2, 4.3. And so this was the beginning of a successful set of fundraisings that have gone on since then. 
Um, HPV vaccine, very interesting. When we brought this to the board initially, there were a number of board members who did not want HPV to be brought in, not because they didn't understand it was important, but because they were worried that it would distract us from vaccinating children. And so it's been interesting to watch this. Of course, we worked on trying to understand how to use it in children um, and having pilot uh, studies initially, but then went on to being our most impactful vaccine, not with enough um, uh, volumes. And so now what we've had to do is, is go ahead and, um, and, and relaunch this now, and we hope to get to 86 million girls by the end of 2025. And, and, and the Ebola advanced purchase commitment was a really, really important piece of our history because this was a situation where there was a vaccine that um, you know, potentially could make a difference, but there's no marketplace for a vaccine like this. Uh, Ebola, there had been 26 previous Ebola outbreaks before West Africa. There were usually dozens of cases or maybe 100 cases, usually in isolated African areas. That doesn't make a market. So, Gavi stepped up using, we didn't have the money, but the board was willing to take the risk. We had IFM to backstop us, and we, we created a market for this. We said we'd put up to $390 million on the table to buy a vaccine, and that put an incentive in place for vaccines to move forward. Um, lots of work in improving our partnerships. We began to look at diagnostics, and this was again controversial because you know, the, the question was, is this mission creep? Are we doing something else? But turns out that when we began to improve diagnostics, countries could more rapidly figure out if there was an outbreak. And when they figured out there was an outbreak, they could respond quickly or deal with another disease that wasn't yellow fever. And this actually turned out probably to be cost saving for Gavi because at the end, if it's a smaller outbreak, then it doesn't have to um, um, uh, be distributed. Um, it, it became clear in this last cycle that middle income countries were being somewhat left behind. So the board allowed an engagement of that um, uh, first parasitic vaccine. And of course, when um, COVID-19 emergency occurred, um, uh, Gavi stepped in with our alliance partners and created COVAX. So I think this is a little bit of the history of what's happened over time um, and help explain where we ended up to today. Um, one of the things that's happened over time is that we started out, as I mentioned, really immunization of, of infants in the first year of life, and that has shifted then to adolescent girls, but now outbreak response includes adults, and of course Ebola was elderly and others. So we've begun to work towards um, vaccines across um, the life course. Um, we haven't done that explicitly in that we haven't, you know, made the mission all vaccines across the life course, but I think that is the direction we're moving. And if you think about it, the world is, the demographics are changing, there's more elderly populations, and therefore this makes sense from a responding to the needs of countries going forward. And it'll probably be an important part of the conversation in Gavi 6.0. Now, just to point out some really extraordinary things about the power of vaccines. Um, throughout history, um, uh, men were usually killed in warfare, and women died in childbirth. And so, you know, this has been going since the beginning of time. And of course, given, you know, the deaths in childbirth and what happens when a mother, when a family loses a mother, it is incredibly tragic. If we had had a vaccine against um, uh, uh, deaths in childbirth, of course, we'd want it, but we don't. But what's happened over this period is there has been a reduction in maternal mortality um, with interventions for it. And today, more women are dying of cervical cancer than die in childbirth. And of course, the tragedy of this is we do have a very good vaccine for um, uh, cervical cancer. And so this is really highlights the importance of this and why this is so, so critical to our mission. Here's another example, a second cancer vaccine um, many people don't know that in, in the early 2000s, we worked in China. So China had a terrible problem. They had hepatitis B, which was transmitted from mother to child. About 10% of, of um, children were infected. And if you're infected in childhood, you will go ahead and increase your risk of a chronic infection and then getting liver cancer. And that occurs usually as a pretty young person and is, is devastating, you know, 100% fatal and... And, um, and, and the question for China was, could you, when it was really a developing country, could you distribute this in the poorest areas of China? So we worked in the west of China, 
and worked with the government and was able to prove that you could get to very high coverage. That led the Chinese government to expand their, um, their, their hepatitis B um, vaccination rate. They're very effective at that, got to very high cover levels. And you can see here what's happened. Um, you know, the car carriage rate has gone way down. Um, it's happened across ages. And, and um, what's really interesting about this is we've seen that liver cancer rate come down, down, down. So China, which has you know, played a set of different roles. Here they were a recipient. Later on, they became um, a donor. They also um, uh, pre-qualified vaccines and became a supplier. And then in, in, in COVID actually gave the largest grant ever given to a non, um, you know, multilateral agency as part of their support for what we do. Now, I mentioned the importance of health systems. I'm not gonna go into great detail about that. But um, you know, this is an extraordinary slide because w I showed you at the beginning that drop in coverage rate. This is a real tragedy, that, that drop, which was 4% in, in um, 2020 and another 1% uh, in, in 2021. We don't know where we're going to end up in 2022 because we don't have the data, although we think there's been some recovery. Um, but, but the issue is, is if you had said to me, Countries that have fragile health systems are now going to deliver doses to the elderly, to healthcare workers, to immunosuppressed populations in large numbers around the world. What do you think is going to happen to their routine immunization? I would say, of course, I hope that they keep doing it. But if I had said, what do I think? I would have said maybe it's going to go down by 10, 20, 30, 40 percent. Um, the fact that it went down 5 percent is, is a terrible thing from a public health perspective, but this is extraordinary because you can see over time from 2000 to 2020, the number of doses has um, the delivered has increased because of the number of vaccines that have increased. But in 2021, there was a threefold, over threefold increase in the number of doses that were given. And what this tells you is that that is a pretty resilient system. It was a very difficult time. People burned out. There was, you know, compromise of many things in the countries. But the fact that they were able to do this is something we should all be very proud of because that system has been built over time. And compared to other interventions, this is the one that did the, the best. Um, as we move towards Gavi 5.0, 5.1, one of the challenges is trying to reach those that haven't been reached, the so-called um, zero dose. And those zero dose are important because two-thirds of them live below the poverty line, and um, that's about where about 50% of the child mortality that's still happening occurs in these communities. We reach um, before COVID and the outbreak, we reached about 90% of the world's population with at least one dose of routine vaccines. So one of the things that's happened over time is that Gavi has had to move not just to national level um, to discuss these, um, but has begun um, increasing its expenditures on health systems, but with subnational targeting. And here's an example. It's one thing to say that Uganda has a pretty good system in terms of its performance, you know, with relative high coverage. But obviously, if you're trying to get to zero dose, you got to know where the reds are and where the greens are, and 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 work with the country to target them. So this has been a process of technology and a change that's occurred in Gavi to be able to get to this point. Um, another important point is we, we work on trying to bring innovation. Um, and um, you know, one of the most interesting innovations we've worked on is trying to improve the cold chain. Vaccines need to be stored in, in, a, in a cold box. Um, before the outbreak, we brought 66,000 new units of cold chain. Of course, um, that helped us when COVID came, but uh, we also ended up in COVID having to build larger walk-in cold rooms, but then with the mRNA vaccines, um, ultra cold chain, minus 80 degrees. But this is an example from a country. Here's Burkina Faso, and you can see in pink up here is, is, is gas fridges. They're very inefficient. You run out of gas, the filters break, the, the wicks break, et cetera. And you can see the transition by 2022 what you've got in, 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 in light blue down here are solar fridges. So we've also environmentally moved towards better fridges and more sustainable systems for the world. And I think, again, this is some of the untold um, things that we've done. 
um, when we when we had to deal with COVID, um, we we had um, you know a series of systems that had been improved. I've just talked about the cold chain, but also we had digital health systems that have been brought out across the population. Work on leadership management and coordination to build capacity. Um, working on improving campaigns and and um, and and speed at rapid um, vaccine introductions. Um, built up uh, regulatory systems in countries. All of these were important to that incredible response that occurred with COVID, which of course wasn't good enough and we need to do better, but um, uh, shows the power of those long-term investments. Now I mentioned that, uh, that uh, um, uh, pandemic preparedness and response are fundamental to Gavi and, and Gavi is to, to those. This looks at the amount of money we spend um, in our core and of course in COVAX on this issue. So. We have preventive vaccinations to avert outbreaks. We have stockpiles. Those stockpiles, by the way, are global. Um, if you're a Gavi country, you use a stockpile, you get um, finance to use it, and you, you vaccines are provided free of charge. If you're another country, you get them immediately, and then you're supposed to eventually pay us back, and you pay the cost of it. Um, we had these health and, and investment systems for delivery. COVAX, of course, specialized in this work, and then the, the laboratory diagnostics. And I think you know, there's been a lot of learnings, and one of the important issues is to take the learnings that occurred and, and bring those back into the work that we're trying to do. So um, how do we have better surge capacity? How do we have um, upfront financing? How do we um, diversify manufacturing um, so that there are more uh, places that are producing products? These are the issues that need to happen during this period as we move beyond the outbreak into um, where we are um, uh, going forward. Um, these outbreaks, by the way, are getting worse. Why? Um, there's not only a challenge with antimicrobial resistance, but as the population increases, as climate change occurs, people are moving, there's migration, more contact with animals, there's a lot more conflict as a result of this, and then people, when they're displaced, often go into urban areas, and so these urban centers get denser and denser. And so what you can see is um, uh, total numbers of outbreaks going up, and this is going to be a challenge, I would argue, in a sense, um, it's evolution evolutionarily certain that this is going to happen, so um, we need to be better prepared for this going forward. An example of this would be cholera. Um, uh, cholera is interesting in that um, there was an oral vaccine for travelers, but there wasn't one. It was only when we got new vaccines that were better to be used that this really became an important product. And what's interesting is, and so the, the, the team will remember that, um, you know, one day somebody came to me and told me that a country so-and-so announced it has a cholera outbreak. And I said, that's great. And they said, it's great that they have a cholera outbreak. And I said, no, it's great that they admitted they have a cholera outbreak. But because before there was a good vaccine, people used to talk about acute watery diarrhea because there's stigma associated with cholera, and therefore we didn't understand the magnitude of the problem. Now there's a really good intervention. With these, with these changes, we've seen um, of, of, of outbreaks and, and climate change, et cetera, we've seen more and more outbreaks. So we're right now at the highest number ever shipped. Um, and one of the challenges that we're working on with manufacturers is this is a vaccine hopefully over time we can use preventively to hotspots. If we do that, cholera should reduce and then therefore the market for the vaccine will go down. So it's not a, 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 an incredible growth market and yet right now we need more doses because of the effects of climate. So these are some of the challenges that Gavi does. So let me just t take a, a, a shift over and just talk for a few minutes about, about COVAX. And I think you know, the critical issue is um, our goal here has been to respond what countries need to provide them a broad portfolio of vaccines, turns out the largest in the world. Um, we initially didn't think we had a supply delivery finance because many others had money, but it became clear that that money might not be timed and available when people need it. So we ended up uh, providing support for delivery as well. And of course, this had to happen quickly with all of this under the rubric of trying to make sure that we had equity. Um, some of the achievements that occurred with COVAX in the previous pandemic, um, and, and that was um, the swine flu pandemic, there were almost no doses that got to developing countries. Um, the first um, uh, COVAX dose 
reached countries 39 days after the first high-income jab. That's a historic first. Um, we've um, delivered now um, close to 2 billion doses. Um, and if you look at the uh, 87 COVAX AMC countries, about 1.75 billion doses to those. When we look at the outcomes now, there was obviously delays early on with vaccine national and extort bans, but today we have 55% of lower income countries with a complete primary series. 82% of the um, of the healthcare workers um, and 69% of older adults. We would like those to be higher, but this is an extraordinary accomplishment and something that we should all be very proud of. And of course, we were able to raise substantial capital, more than $12 billion, to be able to support on this. We are hoping to continue to provide countries with support for COVID vaccines, and the board will, in this coming meeting, uh, be looking at that specifically with the fact that demand has dropped down, but of course we don't know what's going to happen with the epidemic. Now, one of the interesting things about um, the way Gavi works is, um, is the issue of sustainability. And I think, um, just to say a word about this, um, you know, the, the, the poorest countries um, have to pay something, and it's actually 20 cents a dose. The purpose of that is not that that's a massive contribution, but it is to get a conversation going between the Minister of Health and Minister of Finance. And that's critical because what you want over time is them to have a line item for vaccines in hard currency. So that happens for however long it is, and then they pass a threshold, and they then start increasing their coverage 15% a year, um, and then eventually they cross another economic threshold. And um, they used to have five years to um, complete uh, going up to a full financing. Um, that has recently been extended to eight years, given the financial situations and the number of vaccines that countries have done. And then, um, of course, when they graduate, one of the things that's really important is that the, the countries aren't given another increase by companies, you know, of pricing, because this is a heavy lift. And so um, uh, co uh, companies have guaranteed five years of keeping the prices flat. Uh, that's here. And then, of course, we've also worked with middle-income um, countries, as we've mentioned. Now, the, the secret to all of this is trying to get the price point down so that countries can afford these vaccines. Because when they first come out, they're quite expensive. So this is really the, the model that is behind um, Gavi. Um, to do these things, um, we have um, a lot of innovation that, that, that we've done. I've mentioned some of these already around cold chain, but also in the types of vaccines, the tools that go with that, um, uh, the, the digital side of things, logistics like our, our drone delivery system here, and then a series of, of financing innovations that are really unique to Gavi, but make a real difference in allowing donors to maximize the use of their finance and to make sure that money is available where, where it's needed at the right time. So, um, you know, where are we going? Well, obviously, um, um, the Gavi 5.0 strategy, which, as I mentioned, is mostly zero dose um, and um, trying to, um, um, you know, deal with um, uh, backsliding and catching up the mischief from COVID. Also, the relaunch of the HPV program, critical that we uh, move forward to launch the malaria vaccine program, which is an enormous demand in countries. Um, but we've added two more things. One is the integration of the COVID program, which is going to be important into our, our program for countries to have access to vaccines. And then bringing our pandemic preparedness and response work, um, including to regional manufacturing, but doing that across the entire alliance so that people are working. Of course, we don't know what we're going to do in 6.0. That's the work of the board in this next um, year um, to see where we'll go. So as we think about Gavi in this next period, um, what are some of the critical issues? Well, we've got to deal with the backsliding that we've already talked about. There is increased pressures on the health systems given the growth of population mi migration and fragility and conflicts. Um, what's going to be critical is these climate emergencies, reshaping of the global architecture, and then how we take these new tools that are being developed and making sure they're available to everyone so that we can take on this much bigger challenge going forward. I just want to finish with one last slide, and this is a forward-looking slide, but to give you a sense of where we could go. So what's this particular challenge? So um, if you look at um, um, uh, um, facilities 
in developing countries, 41% uh, of the facilities do not have um, access to electricity. Um, and if you think about that, that's a real challenge. If you have to do a delivery at night, you have to do it by candlelight. I can tell you, having, having been involved in doing deliveries at night by candlelight, it is really hard. And so what people have tried to do is you know, put diesel generators, and that's not great for the environment. Of course, you can run out of diesel. Um, and so one of the challenges is, since we are going ahead and, and solarizing clinics for immunization, why can't we solarize the clinics more broadly so they can have lights, they can have um, you know, uh, uh, computers, cell phone charged, et cetera. So this makes sense, it's, it's a smart thing to do, but one of the challenges, of course, in doing this is who pays for it and is this mission creep again? So we're in the process of now working with our partners to see if we could do this, what it actually would cost, um, you know, what the challenges would be, and then we'll have a debate on how we could move forward to do this more systemically, but this can look as a way that we can make a difference in primary health care more broadly, um, but also have an effect on the environment and make people's lives better. So with that, I'll stop and thank you.